Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful installation of Lake Hall Reading Series. Uh, my name is Wendy. I work here at the Teaching and Public Library. Um, and this is one of uh, many years now that we've been doing this, and we're really glad that you can all join us both here and elsewhere. Uh, just a couple of quick things before we get started, and Lynn Berryfield introduces our two authors. The first is that you please go into the same record as possible so you don't have um, I wanted to give some thanks to a few different groups very quickly because this is not the most interesting part I know. Um, one to the Lander Reveal, without which we would not be having the Windfall series. So thank you so much for your hard work. And it's wonderful. I also wanted to thank um, the two fundraising groups at the Eugene Public Library. There's the Friends of the Eugene Public Library and the Eugene Public Library Foundation. Both groups tirelessly support all of our programs and staff and what we do at our three branch here at the uh, They fundraise, they are just fantastic individuals and fantastic people. Thank you so much to them. Um, this is about an hour long, so there'll be readings. Uh, the lights don't go out right at 7 or 7.30. So feel free to mingle and snack. Uh, there will be questions at the end and conversation. So it's a great, great evening. So please, Joan, come on up and uh, do your thing and enjoy the uh, meeting. I love to be like. <laughs> and before we begin, I'm going to do what I always forget to do next month. We have a flyer here. Next month, Grace Richards and Brenda Johnson and Lynn Lee. I'm pronouncing her name right. They're going to read. Uh, you can get a flyer over there. And you can also buy books of our authors today. So, our first reader is going to be Adam Horvath. And um, Adam says he was fatally infected. Infected by Chaucerian irony while studying English at Columbia and has never recovered. <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't quite fatal. <laughs> he was a senior book acquisition editor for several university presses, Cambridge, Case, Western Reserve, and Indiana, and a trade book editor for McGraw Hill. He is the author of two collections of poetry. Conundrums and Melancholia, and a chapbook, Flamingo Heaven and Other Lofty Concerns, the translation of Alejandro Casona's play Suicide Prohibited in Springtime was published in Modern Spanish Theater and was performed on the Canadian Broadcast Corporation Radio Network. He is currently translating a volume of Micro Quintus. Flash fiction by Latin American authors to be published by No Reply Press in Portland. That is my phone and is not able to turn it off. Have patience, please. And my phone is under here and I was struggling with someone to join me how to turn it off and we couldn't do it. So it'll stop me here in a moment. Cannot believe it. I'm going to read the end of this again. So, in any case, as um, translation, um, a volume of Micro Quintos, flash fiction um, by Latin American authors, is to be published by No Reply Press in Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. John. Start speaking like this. Uh, tell me if I'm loud enough or. Okay. Okay. So thanks. That's better. Uh, thanks so much for coming. It's um, delighted to see so many familiar faces. And it's great to see so many fresh faces. Um, so thank you all. I want to give a shout out to everyone who's tuning in from cyberspace. Welcome, welcome, welcome. 
thanks again uh, my part to the Lane Literary Guild and our fabulous Dean Public Library. We're so lucky to have this library. And thanks to Joan, Erica, Wendy, and Laura for orchestrating this evening's event. So I'm going to read first some selections from my book, Melancholia, and then I'll read some things that are going into my next book. Uh, I want to thank my publisher, Griffin Gonzalez of No Reply Press, for the beautiful job he did designing my book. I'm so glad he was able to use this painting by the great Italian surrealist, Giorgio de Chirico. And inside, there is a two-page map showing some of the whimsical places in the imaginary realm that I call melancholia. Uh, there are also funny little drawings sprinkled throughout the book. There'll be some here if you want to browse in them later. And my publisher says if anyone wants to buy a copy today, he's authorizing a special windfall reading price of ten dollars. Okay, uh, the modernist poet Marianne Moore wrote a poem about poetry. In fact, she called it poetry, and it begins with a provocative assertion. I, too, dislike it. Well, it turns out Mary Moore didn't really dislike poetry, just things written by what she called half poets. But maybe some of you aren't entirely convinced that you like poetry. So before plunging into melancholia, I want to read you a dozen reasons to love this poem. This poem can make a meatloaf just like your mom's. This poem will snuggle up to you on a cold night. This poem will laugh at all your jokes, even if it's heard them before. This poem will never hold a grudge against you. This poem does a hokey pokey. This poem would love to go on a blind date with you. If no one's looking, this poem eats peanut butter straight from the jar with a soup spoon. This poem adores you, even when you're exasperating. This poem does not snore. This poem loves to roll around in the snow. This poem is packed with healthy antioxidants and phytonutrients. This poem will whisper sweet nothings into your ear. Okay, now let's plunge into melancholia. So the title of my book, Melancholy, was actually meant to be tongue-in-cheek. It's not as grim as it sounds. Uh, the idea for an imaginary realm called Melancholia sprang from a poem I had written called Rainbow. And the impetus for Rainbow was a quote from a Wallace Stevens poem, Gubinal. Stevens wrote, that strange flower, the sun, is just what you say. Have it your way. The world is ugly. And the people are sick. Rainbow. Imagine if you can, and I really do hope this requires some effort on your part, a dystopia called melancholia, where the world is ugly and the people are sick. In melancholia, sighting a rainbow causes no one's heart to leap up. Just the opposite. Lovers seeing a rainbow are cast into despondency. Stop holding hands and trot on lonely, avoiding one another's glances. Those lucky enough not to be in love are convinced it's an ill omen. The cynics among them are convinced that leprechauns have cunningly contrived to place booby traps at the rainbow's ends, and that the rainbow itself is merely there to lure the unwary. If you've ever been married or in a long-term relationship, you probably won't have trouble relating to the two short things I'm going to read next. And the first is called The Environment. Does this work? Yes? No? Okay. The Environment. Convinced I had become, behaved unbecomingly toward her. Convinced I had behaved unbecomingly toward her in her dreamless, 
she confronted me about it when she awoke this morning. Brushing aside my protestations of innocence, she judged me insufficiently remorseful and declined to speak to me all day. <laughs> the next is called the Orca in the Bed. <laughs> It's like having an orca in the bed, my wife declared, as I tossed and turned, struggling to find a comfortable position. I didn't bother to reply, but with a meaningful flick of my tail fin, as I dove beneath the covers, I flung a gentle splash of salt water in her direction. <laughs> So I have a sp special fondness for old timey slang expressions and cliches, and I thought it would be fun to see what I could write just using cliches. And the result is called the soprano in the bullpen. Let's face it, I'm not gonna get my ducks all lined up in a row before I bought the farm. And I doubt my ship will come in in time for me to save my fat from the fire. Yeah. They say there's a silver lining in every cloud. Perhaps, but I can tell you this much, it never rains, but it pours. <laughs> I know, I know. It ain't over until the fat lady sings. But correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Isn't that a soprano warming up in the bullpen? Memento mori is a Latin phrase that means, remember, you are going to die. Now, I've written something called Memento mori, but in it, I simply recite the names of a few of the many species of animals that have gone extinct in modern times, and what colorful names they are. Memento mori. Memo to self. Someday, and not so very long from now. Like the Malagasy hippopotamus, the lesser mystery flying fox, the eastern Canary Islands chip chat, Newton's parakeet, the Aldabra brush border, the Cape Verde giant skink, the ascension of flightless crake, the passenger pigeon, and of course the dodo. You too will be extinct. <laughs> I've taken, I've written another poem on the Memento Mori theme, but this time I took a lighter approach. And it is called How I Leave at its Start. How Irony Got It Started. Here's life. Well, I am. It's great, ain't it? Now, go out and have yourself a ball. Take a stroll around the garden and pick up some nice names for all the animals. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot to mention, you, you'll die later. What? Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> so after poking fun at the divinity in that last one, I thought I really owed it to God to give me a chance to respond. And here is feeling misunderstood. You don't understand me at all, God complained. You have no idea what it's been like for me all these eons. I thought when I allowed hominids to evolve, I get some respect and appreciation, but frankly, it's been nothing but grief so far. Wars, idolatry, petty larceny, you name it. Why did I even bother? It's been just one headache after another. Homo sapiens sapiens? Ha! Ah, that's a rich one. Things started to go downhill shortly after I stirred up the primordial soup. Plants seemed like a pretty good idea at the time, but animals were, let's just say, problematic even before I let the hominids evolve. Remember the dinosaurs? Those were a flop. <laughs> as far as people go, it's been pretty much a mess ever since Adam and Eve. I'm speaking figuratively, figuratively, of course. You do know those are made up people, don't you? 
bedtime stories for prejudice hominids dreamed up by other hominids just to amuse themselves. All that stuff about the serpent and the so-called apple is just a lot of hee-haw. Don't believe everything you read. But as I was saying, I really don't think you understand me at all. And if you think you have it tough, just try being omniscient and impotent for a while, maybe for an eternity. <laughs> The next poem is about the role that entropy plays in our daily lives. And since Shinua Achebe, the Nigerian novelist, already used the title, Things Fall Apart, I called my poem, Common Dates, Familiar Things. The book you're holding right now, if you're reading this in a book, may have been pristine when you first picked it up, but it will soon enough sludge or stain or tear, or become dog-eared, if it hasn't already. And you will wince at the first blemish and chide yourself for being so careless or clumsy and resolve not to let it happen again. Of course it will. And you'll probably esteem the book itself as an object, just a tiny bit less for its newly acquired defect. But the fate of your new book merely foreshadows the individual fates of waiting all the familiar things around you without exception. And it is probably for that reason that you shape when the original blemish occurred. So, contemplate the immensal fate of all those familiar things, the things whose very familiarity confers a feeling of comfort that can't last. Sooner or later, they will all craze, crack, Smash, shatter, wrinkle, fade, tatter, fray, shred, unravel, crumble, degrade, dissolve, droop, wilt, ossify, rust, erode, decay, tarnish, corrode, melt, and grow moldy, rot, putrefy, stink, tilt, totter, tumble, collapse, implode, or explode, be smashed to smithereens, head, wane, founder, sink, windle, shrivel, dry up, turn to dust, blow away, Dim, go fuzzy, fizzle out, or disappear entirely and be lost through memory, which is itself already slowly loosening its grip on things that were once so recently still graspable, seemingly unforgettable. <laughs> Uh, the foreknowledge conundrum requires no introduction. When you've, when you've attained full geezerdom like me, you might find yourself tempted to lament, if only I had known back then what I know now, but not so fast. If you'd known back then what you know now, surely you would have made plenty of different choices leading to different outcomes. Isn't that the whole point? So when you got to be your present age, you could never know what the things you know now that you wish you'd known back then. Put that in the pipe and smoke. <laughs> so, my publisher told me that the search term that people use most often when they're trying to find my book online is absurdist poetry. <laughs> Perhaps, <laughs> if you're wondering why. Perhaps it's because it includes things like this. Brunch at the Absurdist Cafe. What's the marsupial du jour today? Oh, yes, opossum bisque. Let's start with that. Chocolate vodka, bring it on. Lizard, gizzards, no, none today. But the flamingo clave with a nouveau riche sauce sounds divine. The platter of petite mixed emotions, drizzled with trompe will go nicely with that. A bottle of the 1954 haute bourgeoisie will be just a ticket. And for dessert, the escargot gâteau is certainly tempting, but could you pop that off with just a dollop of Belschmerz, please? That would be so decadent. So, escargot gâteau is snail cake. And Belchner's 
is a German word that means world weariness or melancholy. But when I first heard it, it sounded to me like it should mean with me. <laughs> Okay, we're going to depart from melancholia. There's lots more in here if you want to browse in the books on the site. This is just a small sample. And I'm going to read a few things that are going to go into my next book, starting with Jitterbug. And all you need to know about Jitterbug is it takes place in the Middle Ages. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin is a question that vexed many of scholastic noggin and caused an awful lot of late night candle wax to be burned back in medieval times, when people actually had time to lose sleep over things like that. I don't know much about angels. If I had to guess, I'd bet an infinite number of them could dance on the head of a pin. What I really want to know is what kind of dance they'd be doing when they got there. I'd love to think <laughs> it'd be a jitterbug. <laughs> With a nod to Alfred Hitchcock's 1956 film, The Man Who Knew Too Much, I decided to call my next poem, The Man Who Knows Too Much. I could tell you a thing or two. I know what's what and who's who. I know which end is up. I know my way around. I know things aren't always what they seem. I know what's, which side my bread is buttered on. I know what's coming down the pike. I know what being watched feels like. I know why the cat swallowed the canary. I know what why I know what's done and it can't ever be undone. I know where the bodies are buried. I know when it's time to keep them up. <laughs> the ladies. Uh, this opens with a short quote from a novel by Patricia Lockwood. Suddenly, all those Russian novels where a man turns into a teaspoonful of blackberry at a country house began to make sense. <laughs> the base. One particular scene from one of the great 19th century Russian novels has etched itself into my memory. I read it years ago, but it's as fresh today as if I had read it yesterday. The protagonist is one of those impulsive, idealistic young men, so common in novels of that era, a classic overthinker. Let's call him Pyotr Petrovich. Striding into a grand ballroom, a high vaulted room the size of a parade ground, festooned with gilt framed oil paintings and bright hued damask tapestries, all brilliantly illuminated by many chandeliers. Pyotr Petrovich is immediately swept up in a sea of swirling skirts and decolletage, heel stomping, cossack boots, and rattling sabers. The throng of dancers parts for a split second, just long enough for Pyotr to glimpse a tall gaze perched on a pedestal at the opposite end of the ballroom. His gaze fixes upon the base, and he knows without knowing how he knows it's a genuine Ming Dynasty base. Not a knockoff, not a mere piece of bric a brac, but a priceless Ming vase. Aware of the absurdity of what he's about to do, Piotr resolves at that moment I am not going to knock over that vase tonight. <laughs> You've already guessed how this has to end. <laughs> Before the night is over, <laughs> driven ineluctably by his fate, poor Piotr manages willy nilly. Despite the vow he had made early that evening to either brush up against or stumble into the base, toppling it to its pedestal, reducing it to a heap of shards before the startled eyes of the assembled onlookers. That scene is so vivid in my memory, it's exactly how I remember it from the book. But what book was it and who wrote it? Was it something by Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Turgenev, Gogol? Or might I just possibly have invented the whole thing? So, there's a postscript to this. For years, I was sure I had read that scene in the Russian novel, but I never succeeded in identifying either the book or the author. So I began to think I just made it up. Then a friend on the University of Arvin faculty, who happened to be 
his literary polygon, steered me to Dostoevsky's novel, The Idiot. I dug out my tattered old copy of The Idiot, which I read probably 55 or 60 years ago. Sure enough, in chapter seven of part four, Prince Mishkin, while expounding his views on religion, swings his arms wildly and knocks over an expensive Chinese maze to his chagrin and embarrassment. So I really had read that scene. History solved, ah, except for one thing. The part about the prince vowing ahead of time that he would not knock over the maze was my own invention. I would like to think that Dostoevsky would have approved. <laughs> I want to dedicate the next poem to my good friends Peter and Marcia, and to any other enthusiastic bird watchers who are here today. It's called Archaeopteryx. Now, Archaeopteryx, sometimes referred to by its German name, Urvogel, which means primeval bird, is a genus of avian dinosaurs. The remote ancestors of all the birds that grace our world with song and beauty. Archaeopteryx. I was gobsmacked when I peered from my bedroom window this morning and observed an Archaeopteryx at my backyard bird. I rubbed my eyes in disbelief. An Archaeopteryx. Why, the last Archaeopteryx was said to have lived in Bavaria at the end of the Jurassic era, 150 million years ago. <laughs> The textbooks all agree to was extinct, but there one was perched on my feeder. There could be no mistake. It had a bony tail, hyperextensible second toes, long wings with rounded tips, three fingers with claws, jaws with sharp teeth, skeletal features common with dromosaurids and troodontids. It had both flight and tail feathers. Its body plumage was downy and included well developed feathers on the legs. So beyond any doubt, it was an archaeopteryx. How it had wound up in my backyard in Oregon's Willamette Valley in the 21st century was anybody's guess. I lost no time contacting the local Audubon Society to report this remarkable site, only to be dismissed rather huffily by someone who claimed to be an ornithologist. <laughs> Listen, right now we're up on the trail of a muscovy duck who just made a rare appearance over at Torino Lake. Please don't waste our time. He hung up a crook. I grabbed my binoculars and returned to the bedroom room. Just in time to see the archaeopteryx swoop down gracefully onto the lawn and gobble up a nematode, one of the species believed to have gone extinct in Tasmania at the end of the transcure. I made a careful note of this in my birding journal and decided to tell no one about it. <laughs> read one more thing from my next book and then I'm going to give you a very quick glimpse of what I'm working on right now. Uh, this is called Surveillance. Now, if you've ever watched British police procedurals, you know the first thing the detective inspector says in the briefing room. Get me to CCTV. <laughs> London is, after Beijing, probably the most heavily surveilled city on the planet. Last summer during the coronation of King Charles, the London Police Department took an unprecedented step of using advanced facial recognition technology in real time to scan the crowds, spot potential troublemakers. It's not just London. We're rapidly losing the battle to preserve our privacy. Even our household gadgets are increasingly able to track what we do. Have you ever wondered why targeted advertising pops up on your computer and cell phone all the time? The New York Times has run two major articles on surveillance just this past week. One about the spreading use of facial recognition technology in airports. Eventually, your movements will be tracked from the moment you enter an airport until the moment the plane takes off. We tracked after that as well. The other article is about a new kind of low orbit satellite equipped with cameras and zoom in on individuals on the ground below. There are plans to launch 24 of these initially into orbit. More will never follow. And the potential is there for any government 
it gains access to one of these to snoop on its citizens. Okay, in my phone surveillance, I take a slightly lighthearted look at what is actually, in my view, a fairly sinister development. Surveillance. We're keeping tabs on you, your furtive comings and goings, and your present whereabouts are an open book to us. Do we employ advanced facial recognition recognition technology? You bet we do. You really need to ask. We've cataloged your physiognomy, the color of your eyes and hair, your height and weight, and analyzed your distinctive gait. We know your shoe size, the style of underwear you favor, the people you associate with and meetings you attend, your favorite ice cream flavor, the things you read, and your quirky little guilty pleasures, all that and much, much more. Your pheromone output, your FICO score. Are you surprised you are a person of interest? Don't flatter yourself, everything is. Our telepathic thought interception program, TTIP, is still in its beta version, but we think we can already make a pretty good guess of what you are thinking of doing next. So think twice. <laughs> And as that's part of our TTIP, Telepathic Thought Interception Program, I thought I was making that up. I recently learned that computers focusing on human cognition are being programmed to predict what any particular individual might be thinking. So it's recently science fiction is becoming our spooky reality. And finally, I'm going to give you a quick peek at what I'm working on next. Translating a book of what are called microcuentos in Spanish, stories arranged from just a couple of sentences to a page or two. One I'm going to read is by a Venezuelan writer, Gabriel Jimenez Eman, and it's called Kalim's Arms. Kalim tore off his arms and threw them into an abyss. When he came home, his wife asked in surprise, What have you done with your arms? Tired of them and ripped them off, Colleen replied. Well, you'll have to go find them. You're going to need them for lunch. Where are they? In an abyss, far from here. And how did you manage to remove them? I pulled the right one off with the left one, and the left one with the right one. That can't be, is what he responded. You needed the right one to take off the left one, but you had already removed it. I didn't know that woman. My arms are very strange. Can we just forget about it? <laughs> Go to bed, said Colleen, embracing his wife. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times um, listening to this. Can you hear me? Yeah. Listening to this, that I, I tell him to be prophetic and talking about my own life. Um, seriously, I came here in 1983 with my seven year old son. We went to a art gallery and he knocked over an expensive vase. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think we were together. At least we took on it. So, our next reader is going to be Paul Neville. He's an award-winning writer who has worked at daily newspapers, including the Register Guard in Eugene. His first novel, The Garbage Brothers, is a funny and poignant coming-of-age story that critics give two thumbs up to. Kierkegaard's Reviews calls it a colorful, big-hearted novel about the summer of falling trash. Paul lives in Eugene, where he is a singer, songwriter, and writer, and is working on a new novel, Chasing Sam Bradford. His website is paulnevilleauthor.com. So if you don't think you'll remember that, I do have a few flyers about this reading that you get that website. That's my sound. Okay, okay. loud voice. It's too much. No. I, uh, good to be here. I'm amused whenever I go into a library, do a library, and 
there were several reasons. Because I was, can you hear me? Is that this way? Yeah. I was uh, one of the worst offenders uh, as a youth at public libraries. I would not return books until there was just a formidable amount of overdue uh, amount. And I, I told the library, the librarian, uh, several libraries where I lived, I was always moving across the country. I'm sure they had my reputation preceded me. I said, I, I can't give it up. I got to keep reading. And I remember what cured me was a, I got a book called A Canticle for Leelands. How many read that? I wanted a science fiction book. When I was in seventh or eighth grade, it changed in my life. It shook me up. And I couldn't let go of it. I had to keep reading it. And I came back, and the woman at the front desk said, I'm sorry, this is $25 overdue. This was back in 1975. That was like $100. And she said, But I'm going to pay for it. And pay for it out of the And she said, Just promise me, you'll never do this. And I didn't, I didn't, but I'm always so thankful. So, uh, I'm going to uh, read tonight, talk about my debut novel, The Garbage Brothers, and uh, it won't surprise some of you to learn that this book is uh, partly autobiographical. It's based loosely, very loosely at times, on my experience as an 18-year-old in 1969 in the suburbs of Chicago. And the certain, my circumstances were very similar to those of Je uh, the main character, Jesse Buick. So let me briefly set the stage before my first read. And I'm sorry to bring you down from the ethereal heights of Mount <laughs> Holly to, to the county dump, Chicago. So let me briefly set the stage. The story is told from the perspective of 18-year-old Jesse Wheeler, whose country suburban existence shatters when his father dies. And leaving his family stone broke, his thoroughly unequipped, uh, un for real life son to be uh, adrift. And just his mother sells the family house, so he suffers from depression, moves to live with his sister. No colleague will accept him because of his abysmal grades, and that was most certain. And the selective service uh, in the Vietnam War are hard on his trip. And on top of that, he recently found his girlfriend, she's not actually his girlfriend. Just thinks she is um, uh, in the arms of his best friend. So things are not going well in his life. And after graduating barely from high school, I had a counselor who delighted me, reminding me whenever I'd go in and ask about my children, you know, you were in the bottom quartile. <laughs> the bottom quartile is worse than burning my brain. Um, uh, and uh, some talked my way, Jesse talked his way into a summer job working for Willard Sanitation Service with a crew of felons, every last one of them <laughs> felon. Uh, Pat was, uh, who murdered his, his wife, his uh, wife's lover, at the Pink Flamingo Motor Inn, actually kept that's the real name of the motel, and shot his wife in the hip. Pickles claimed that was a mistake. His wife didn't believe it. Uh, <laughs> Zeus, uh, Grits, and an unabashedly Lisping foreman, who was about as wide as he was tall, named Billy Barker, in a flight spec blue collar town of freedom north of Chicago that has long since turned into a upscale summer. So Jesse suffers a brutal, brutal baptism on the job and befriends Zeus, a mercurial, smart as hell former bank robber, and Pickles, a moody giant who served nine years in Joliet, State Penitentiary, for the shooting that I just told you about. And Jesse gets smitten by Iris, the niece of Grits, a co worker and knife wielding serial car thief from Tennessee. I had to play none of these characters. <laughs> um, they're all based on pretty much real people. So I'm going to read you a quick excerpt from my first day on the job just to give you a feel that my new garbage collection has changed from the 1960s. It's now fairly antiseptic. Thing. Somebody sits in the truck, goes around with a pneumatic lift and lifts things up. So my introduction to what Billy Bark and Foreman called this sweet sign of sanitation <laughs> was a fragrant blur of garbage, sweat, and pain. We pulled into the first neighborhood on the route, a street of vintage and affluent homes in the woods near the Fox Breath River. 
Billy stopped the truck and grabbed a pair of filthy brown torn cotton gloves from a shoebox under the driver's seat and tossed them to me. Let me get pumping, he said. He shoved open the driver's door with his big left shoulder and jumped out of the truck, his thick, short legs churning as he hit the ground. I opened my door, gently lowered myself to the ground, and walked to the rear of the truck. By the time I got to Billy, he had pulled both carry cans out of the trough, and his was slung over his right shoulder. Get moving, we ain't got all day, he said. He took up running toward a large red brick ranch house. I picked up my can and chased after him, my new boots slipping on the dewy grass. When I got to the garage, Billy had already yanked the door open and was standing next to two shiny metal garbage cans near the entrance. He tossed the lids on the concrete floor. They clapped like cymbals. Then Billy emptied the first container into his carry can, giving the shiny aluminum sides a quick shimmy and rattling it against the sides of his carry can, peering inside afterward to make sure nothing was stuck up to the bottom. He repeated the process with the next can, then slammed the lids back on the metal cans. Oh, wait, thoughtfully, he said with a malicious grin. The little darling might be clicking. He pulled down the garage door and was off again with his strangely graceful ape run. The half filled carry can slung over his back. Jump over a little bit. By noon, everything that was hurt and shaped now screamed and pulsated. When I picked up my can for the 150th, or was it the 200th time, something wet was leaking out of the can and onto my t shirt and bleeding raw shoulder. I dropped the can on the freshly sodded front lawn. Grabbed the wet sleeve of my t-shirt and pulled it to my nose. Juice. On my shirt, in my wounds, down my side, in my pants and underwear. Dripping now down my right leg and into my new boots. I dragged my can down the truck where Billy waited. What's the matter? Oh, I got a boo-boo? He asked. I'm soaked with goddamn pickle juice, I said. Billy leaned over, took a whip, and a pair of my diagnosis. Definitely Bill. So, take another jump. <laughs> Shortly before 2 p.m., I summoned the courage to ask Billy about lunch break. We were standing in the truck as he held down a lever that caused the massive steel compactor blade to descend into the full hopper at the back of the truck and then ram the garbage into the cavernous truck body. Are we going to stop for lunch? I asked, trying not to sound as whiny and desperate as I felt. Billy looked at me with pitying amusement. If our sweet little tippy toe, tummy rumbling, I think I'm ashamed to say it was too <laughs> He yanked on the lever to haul the descending blade and gaze into the garbage, eyes gleaming like a lizard for a sand plate, searching for a sand plate. In a flash, his thick right hand plunged down the garbage, brushed aside a rotten half head of lettuce and an empty Cheerios box. And grabbing what looked like a grapefruit, dented and lopsided, but still whole and unpeeled. Holy shit, mother of God, Billy said. He gripped the grapefruit with both hands and tore it apart with his filthy claw fingers. He held one jacket half to his face and ground it against his mouth and jaw as if he were a human juicer. He lowered the limp, now meatless rind, and his jaw was wet with juice and pink pulp and paled on his wire thick stubble. Uh, I'm broke yet, he sighed, closing his eyes and shaking his head with a sweet appreciation of what had just slithered down his gullet. He held out the other half to me. Want them? I said. <laughs> so, uh, writing a, a first novel. Through the grace of God, has been blessed with um, uh, that, that first novel that has had some success in the revealing experience. I'm sure you had found this with your your first book. It's a huge amount of work to market your books. I was fortunate to be traditionally published uh, by a publisher, uh, but unless you're John Grisham or Stephen King, you have to do all the marketing. You have to go out and do your arrange your own book tours and do everything. I've been doing that for the last six months, and I'm tired. I want to get back to writing. Um, but it's uh, it, the wonderful part. The flip side is this being with people like you, which has had absolutely been a wonderful experience talking 
and learning about what people appreciate or don't appreciate uh, about writing. And uh, I was terrified when my book went out to reviews or reviews. I did not know what to expect and was braced for just withering criticism. Because this is what I wrote. It's not kind of fit the mainstream stuff that's coming out right now. But Kirkus uh, had the strong praise for it. Portland Book Review gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars and called it a tightly woven tale that leads readers yearning for a sequel. And Chicago Book Review stunned me by giving 5 stars out of 5. Calling it an emotionally satisfying and enjoyable book from beginning to end. So I'm going to be heading out to Chicago soon. <laughs> uh, but far more gratifying than the reviews of any reaction to readers like yourselves. And uh, I'm sure you find this with your poetry. But when people tell me that they're drawn to a particular section of the book, in the case of verse or poem, but with me and the characters, I found myself just deeply moved and surprised and amazed. And I finally began to reflect, why did I, you know, somebody asked, why do I write, write that I write this book? And I didn't know, I didn't have an answer for them. I actually began to think about it. My first answer was why, because I've got all these memories that have been since I was 18 years old, I need to get rid of them. I did put them down on people. But I began to realize I wrote it for these people. I wrote it for these people who became my family when I was 18 years old and I was alone, and uh, who embraced me and became my brothers. That's why it's a book called The Baron's Brother. Uh, next, same one I'm going to read you about somebody who I was my mother for for the year that I was working on Willard Sanitation. On Monday morning, I rolled up to the Greasy Ranch a half hour early. Besides Dolores, the only people in the cafe were a farmer sitting alone at the counter wearing overalls and a green John Deere cap, and Lars the cook, whose spatula was clattering on the grill in the kitchen. Next to the cash register was a Sylvania radio playing the morning farm report. The announcer was saying that corn futures had closed the previous week down 2.7%. I slid into the Willard Sanitation booth, savoring the opportunity to sit for the first time with both butt cheeks on the bench. Good morning, little sweetheart, Laura said. You're bright and early. Coffee. Thank you, I said. And I missed it. So Laura liked me. I didn't know why, but I was appreciative since the rest of the crew with the possible exception of suits, held me in the same regard as a sidewalk turd. <laughs> Dolores set a thick white porcelain cup in front of me. As she filled it with fresh coffee from a holy camper, I noticed her hands were thin and delicate. And smelled like the pink lotion that my mother used when I was a child. Dolores looked like she was in her 40s, and her face was prettier than I had noticed before, with high cheekbones and a sprinkling of freckles on a faintly creased forehead. She wore a standard issue yellow and white waitress dress, nylon stockings, and white kids. Hey, Dolores, I said, making conversation before the rest of the crew arrived. I brought a paperback, the latest collection of Ray Bradbury short stories to kill the time, and pushed it to the side to signal my interest in discussion. Yes, sweetie, you got any kids? Two boys, she said. They're out in Montana with their daddy. I waited for more, but she said nothing. I primed the pump. How old are they? She stood holding a pale green order pad with her right hand. They're nine and a half and just turned 13. She said, their names are Bobby and Baron, and they're the sweetest, squirmiest boys on the face of the earth. Now, what do you want for breakfast? Dear, I like that. I'm more of a country girl than I want to style, she said. What do you want for breakfast, honey? I ordered the number four, a ham and an American cheese omelet with four strips of bacon, hash browns, and toast, and she turned to take my order to the kitchen, and she paused and looked back. How's it going out there with these boys, she asked. They're a spicy group, and I know pumpkin garbage ain't easy work. How are you holding up? I looked at her with gratitude. Someone at the Greasy Ranch actually cared whether I survived my summer job, or at least was kind enough to pretend to care. Oh, okay, I said. 
first two weeks were people were rough, but I think I'll make it through the summer. A lot of the college kids walk away, she said. Crew makes it hard on me. I'm not going to walk away, I said. A minute later, I felt a warm hand on my right shoulder. It was Dolores, who had turned in my order and returned to show me a well-worn white leather belt hole with a photo of two young boys dressed in red blazers and sitting on small blue chairs. They were smiling with intense concentration and had wet combed hair. The youngest was holding a football, the oldest a baseball bat. My boys, the Lord said. I took them to Sears for a portrait last Easter when they were visiting. That's Darren on the right, Bobby on the left. They look like nice boys, I said. Both good looking. They're nice boys, and their mamas let them get them both back. Dolores said. She pulled a bronze coin from the bell hole and held it up in the palm, just high enough for me, but no one else to see. I've been sober more than a year, she said. I'm going to get custody as soon as I find a judge who will give it to me. The bells on the front door jangled before I could answer, and Billy Bart entered, stomping his feet like they were covered with snow, even though it was July. The bell hole disappeared from Dolores' hand as if by magic. Good morning, Billy, Dolores said. What's the world's biggest asshole want for breakfast this morning? <laughs> you know what I want, the Lord, Billy said. I do want to feel special, and it ain't what you think. Now, park your large button that moves with Jesse and keep everything where it belongs. You know where my everything belongs, Billy said. Yes, I do, she said. It belongs right there in your right hand. Dolores poured Billy a cup of coffee, and he slid happily into the booth across from me. The smell of axle grease from his rumpled, filthy work shirt weight wafted across the table and melted in a surprisingly pleasant way. The smell of the coffee. And a good morning to you, Mr. Tippy Toad, he said. You know what got you up now? <laughs> so, um, I want to say briefly about the transition from being journalist for four years. I was like 15 or 20 hours editorial, or writing editorials for the Register Guard, making half a town hate. Uh, and they switch place every week. Um, but uh, I found that some of these really hard to start writing fiction because writing to journalists, writing articles, editorials is a very different discipline. And the, and the word threat is the best way to say it. The reductionism in the writing, and everything's made it very difficult for me to sit at a computer, a laptop, and write. So I did something, went back to my teenage days where I used to hang out in cafes, drink coffee laced with half, half cream and sugar, and write in these uh, notebooks. And I would, back then, I was sure I was going to be an author, and I wrote all this terrible and horrible. Uh, short stories poems, in these books. And so I went back to writing on legal pads. And I wrote this book on how legal pads, probably from this table about this time. And um, it worked. It worked. I, I was able to get out of that and go back to that mindset. Um, but you'd be happy to hear that was for terrible because I got bad handwriting. And I had to do all the moving this, I had to do all the putting this stuff in the end of the lab. So my, my latest book that I finished the preliminary draft, Chasey Sam's Booker, has uh, a type and work written entirely on, on the laptop. So I'm over the, the journalism group, and I'm very thankful that I was able to do that, break loose of all those habits. Um, one thing I want to talk about is the value of a writing group. Some of you here are writers, and uh, any of you member of a writing group? Yeah. It's an invaluable. My writing group has uh, several people in it. A couple of them may have heard of one is Liz Craddy or Elizabeth Engstra. She write, goes by both names. And she's written 28 books, has been on the New York Times bestseller list, but a biography of Lizzie Borden. Um, she's an amazing writer. Sue Palmer, who worked with me at the Register Guard, she wrote a book that got her kicked out of Mormon Church, <laughs> the Land of the Saints. But she's a, she's a beautiful writer. Bob Keeper of the, the uh, uh, Register Guardian over here in House at the Weekly, also as a member of that group. So, very good, very trusting, and 
what we would do is come and read a basically a chapter and we, which make him right ahead and keep going. And uh, you have to love these people, like we trust them and take their hands. So I urge anybody that's in a feels alone in writing and needs to support, find yourself a writing group or start and find people who will support you and need you be fun and more say. And I expected this in honor of you, Kathleen. One chapter is called A Poem for Pickles. I <laughs> was the convicted killer. Her. Pickles and Dolores. Forget about it. Pickles and Dolores were now an official item at the Greasy Wrench. Although Dolores kept up the flirtatious banter with the customers, which was good for tips and the closest thing the cafe had to a floor show. But all was not well in the Pickles Dolores front. There were, as he confided while driving to a route one a rainy August afternoon, quote, serious complications. They started with his wife, Millicent, and Pickles had shot in the hip a decade earlier. He did it after finding her in the sack with an insurance salesman at the Pink Flamingo Motor Inn in Freedom, right across from the greasy wrench truck stop. Norman Phillips was the salesman who Pickles dispatched to the next actuarial world with a couple of blasts from a gun that Millicent had bought for her husband as an anniversary present to present and protect himself from rabid dogs on the route. I did kill a dog, just not the kind she expected, Pickles told me. He, he told the jury that he hadn't meant to shoot Millicent, that the bullet catch that shattered her hip was intended for Mr. Phillips. The jurors believed him, although Millicent understandably remained unconvinced. Pickles said he still visited his wife on the first Sunday of each month at the Liberty Township Home for the Indigent, where the supervisor had years ago learned that Pickles could not be relied upon for financial support. Millicent had been assigned a second floor room that looked out over a grove of trees that surrounded a potter's field, where Millicent informed Pickles on his visits that he was bound any day now, that she was bound any day now. I guess any day means any decade, Millicent, Pickle said. Dolores knows about Millicent, Pickle said, but Millicent had not known about Dolores until she caught a whiff of what his bedridden wife identified as a woman's scent. When Pickles gave her a perfunctory peck on the top of her small, unhappy head at the end of his most recent bedside visit, she confronted him on the spot, and Pickles confessed that he'd fallen for another woman and wanted a divorce. William? I will sign the papers on the same day you bring me a gun so I can shoot you in the hip. <laughs> and you can tell your little girlfriend that she should bring me flowers for saving her from marrying the god awful likes you. <laughs> Pickle said the Lord didn't take the news of Nelson's refusal well. As we drove to the dump around noon to empty our first load of the day and then stopped at the snake pit tavern, Pickle said Dolores was so angry she threatened to bring Nelson to an embroidery. Pillow as a gift and then smothered her. Yeah. Why does Sonoris want to be married? I asked. She told me she's already done it once and it didn't end well. Actually, she's been married three times and they all ended bad, Pickle said. Now that Dolores is sober, she wants to get hitched again to convince a judge out in Colorado to give her custody of her boys. I mean, she and I are crazy about each other. We want to get married, but she really wants to get her boys back. Now, I consider pointing out that marrying a convicted killer was probably not the best way to convince a judge. <laughs> but I wasn't sure how Pickles would react. Plus, there was a more immediate problem that needed to be addressed. Pickles said Dolores was furious, accusing him secretly of wanting to stay married to Millicent, and she had refused to talk or look at him for the past three days. As a result, Pickles moaned in his head like picked up the garbage, all the garbage on Pickles was miserable and I was exhausted. It was time for an intervention, and I remembered my attempt to sway the ever elusive Lila Phelps girlfriend. I was convinced it was my fault. The ever elusive Lila P, midway through our senior year, by reciting a poem I had memorized from Mr. Elmer Walshmith's English class. It had gotten me nowhere with Lila, who broke out laughing before I reached the third stanza. But I thought it might help Pickles win back to Lawrence. Plus, it was the only idea I had. A poem, I told him as we pulled away from the snake pit. You need a poem to show Dolores you love her. 
and make her forget about those in marriage. Pebbles was incredulous. I problem. He said, you think I need a goddamn phone? Trust me, I said, women love poetry. Make them, make them forget the troubles. Dolores needs to remember how much you love her and how much she loves you. Well, give me the damn phone. He said, I'll try anything. I had to memorize two poems in my life. One was Robert Cross Birch's, which I always thought was a fine poem. I particularly liked the lines I'd like to get away from her for a while and then come back to it and begin over. They know faith willfully misunderstanding and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return first to the right place for love. I don't know where it's likely to go back. But that poem wouldn't work for faith. And it certainly wouldn't work for Dolores, who might not be sure who Pickles thought might be snatched up, not to be put down again. A risky poem for a man who'd been convicted of second degree murder by the state of Illinois. The second poem I thought might actually work on Dolores. Work meaning it would convey the thought that Pickles loved her no matter what, even if Millicent would give Pickles a divorce and allow him to marry Dolores. Got it, said, got what, said Pickles, whose mind had evidently moved on during the time that I was reading poetry options. The right home. We were near the intersection with the highway that led to the dump. And Pickles pulled the truck onto a broad, dusty shoulder under the shade tree. He put his hands on the steering wheel and pushed himself back from the driver's seat. The truck idled, and Pickles' face looked drained. I realized that this was not an ideal game to play out for my amusement. Pickles Peterman was distressed. He really did care about the Lord's and her desire to be reunited. When ever man needed the sweet sound of verse, it was Pickles. And here I was, a practitioner, young and experienced, yes, but willing to be of assistance to my fellow man. It's by Robert Burns, I said. Don't care who wrote it, just tell me the poem. It begins, Oh, my loves like a red, red rose. Boob, Pickles said. <laughs> Old Scottish for love. Robert Burns was a Scot, don't worry. Of course, I get it. I'm not saying lose the doors. <laughs> I might say love on a good day. Never lose. <laughs> okay, just say love instead when you recite it to the doors. Just let me finish the damn poem. Short. Pickles at the giant's, giant's eyebrow at my impertinence and then let it go. He closed both eyes. Better be short. I've got to memorize it, he said. I closed my eyes, and there we were, two garbage men in the middle of the great Midwest, sitting under a scraggly oak on the side of the road, with our eyes closed, waiting for the poem that was in my head, the one I had memorized from the poetry anthology that I despised until I opened it one day and read the Robert Burns poem, page 262. Oh, my love, it's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like the melody, sweetly played in tune. I opened my eyes to check on my face. Pickles looked, cocked his head, and said, listening to the summer breeze, I flew through the tree branches hanging over the truck. He nodded his head, or lip extended in appreciation. Not too bad, he said. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> nope, I said, there's more. Here goes. As fair art thou, my bonny lass. Bony? <laughs> bony. I mean, it's beautiful. Okay, it was smiling. As fair as thou, my body like a so deep in love of mine, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gone and dry. Gang means gone. Pickles volunteer. Keep going, he said. To the veterans. Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun, and I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life still run. And fare thee, we will my only love, and fare thee, we will a while, and I will come and I will. And I will come again, my love, for the order of 10,000 miles. I could hear that summer breeze still rustling through the oak. After a few seconds, Pickles opened his eyes, and I thought I could see a touch of moisture at the crinkled edge of the right eye, his right eye. He cleared his throat like an ailing walrus, leaned forward, and started the truck. He shifted in the first, gassed the engine, and the truck jounced onto the highway. He reached over to the glove. Got a battered green notebook and a pencil stub and handed it to me. Write that up for now, he said. So, that was a magnificent reading, I believe.
And um, we now have the exciting part of the evening. Erica has questions for the authors. And her questions are so good, I'm going to ask her to write a book. Seriously. You can see the headlines. Poet calls to her. Um, no, I'm getting caught up in the um, board. So, gentlemen, will you come up and, and thank me? Thank you. Um, so, I just have a few questions, and they're not that questions. I think they're excellent questions, and hopefully the people who are watching this remotely will be very good questions. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a good question. I don't like this one. Okay, okay. Adam, this one's for you. If you could tell your younger writing self anything, what would it be? Start sooner. <laughs> <laughs> good advice, good advice. Um, how about you, Paul? Let's say, don't spend 40 years working as a journalist to be on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and so, Paul, I have another question for you. Is there something about being a journalist that uh, either helps you or hinders you as a fiction writer? Um, I think it helps me in more ways than it harms me. And I talk about one way it harms me in being great. Type of words and, and thinking, overthinking uh, the writing process. But I think it helps me in that I just have a world of things. I've seen so many things, met so many places. I was in Rwanda after the genocide and, you know, covered murders and just, you know, Forest fires. So, I mean, I feel like I got to see like things that most people don't see every. You know, I think it's interesting that it seems to me that a lot of first time retired journalists start creative writing because they didn't get to during their careers. And I don't know about creative writers who suddenly wish to become journalists. Does that ever seem to happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Poets, artists, or writers inspire you? Oh my goodness. So many, so many, so many. So, uh, well, I'll stick with poets probably. Uh, so, certainly some of the great modern European poets like Vistula was in Borska and Czesław uh, Milosz, uh, the Russian poets uh, Mondo Stam and Rosnicensky and Yevtochenko. Here in America, older poets like William Carlos Williams, uh, Theodore Recchi, certainly, uh, Ted Kuzer, more recent poets like David Kirby and Steve Cowett, Robert Frost, always good, never good enough, Robert Frost, um, Marianne Moore, Marge Percy, and uh, Denise Levertoff. So, I'm so glad you said Denise Levertoff. She's one of my absolute favorites, and I don't think that she's being read enough. So, yeah, yeah. So, everyone read to these ones off. That's your assignment. Um, Paul, what is the most difficult part of your writing practice? Uh, I write about twice as much as I end up using. So, it's cutting the, uh, the book into the size, which is a necessity. But I'm beginning to see that magic, how much better you. A, a, a paragraph, a sentence, Jack, you know, just everything is, everything is better. Right? Yeah. And the hardest part also is I've learned, which is very good, is sustaining tension throughout. It's an essential element that didn't translate. I think maybe of the, the, the writing practice that you're doing is kind of helpful with, like, you know, like deciding which parts to choose after you become a yeah, I mean, notebooks. I can put on the other books, yeah, much of it. But not right. Not right. Oh, interesting. Okay, this is going to be for both of you, but Adam, I'll ask you first. Does writing tire you or give you energy? Oh, God, definitely gives me energy. 
and uh, my wife, my wife and views, Julie. We will tell you that uh, it's not rare for her to wake up in the middle of the night and find I'm up and about. It's something came to me. I get uh, ideas for that. Actually, not just ideas for things. Sometimes actual verbiage when I'm sleeping. It's amazing. And uh, so I, and I've learned that you've got to seize the moment. Otherwise, in the morning, it will have all evanesced at the end and brought away by the waves. So I, I get energized uh, any hour of the day or night. Right. Oh, I might. The right, uh, I get, it, it's tired me out until I change my routine. I would get up, check my vehicle, check your times, <laughs> do all the things. I now get up at 5 a.m., take my coffee, start writing. And I write an hour to two hours. So, so uh, and I put in, it just, everything flows. Come out of your dream state, I do your paper. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's good. If I fill it with too much garbage, or distractions. Yeah. I know, I don't know why I feel like I have to check my email. Just in the morning. No, I don't. I'm going to say hello to my husband. Maybe I do. Yeah. Um, so, this is for both of you and Adam. I'll start with you. Is there a writer whose work inspires you, but who writes in a different genre? You have just listed a bunch of poets. So. Sure, but um, um, I mean, always Chaucer. I go back to uh, it's funny, I mentioned being fatally infected with Chaucerian irony, and uh, I was, and I, I still read Chaucer in the English. To this day, I have a copy, multiple copies around the house. Adam, I'm sorry, I'm going to bring this to you, but I think you are here. <laughs> <laughs> I need that in kind of All right, all right. Um, Paul, how about is there, are there writers and writers that are just in the one, one, Ray Bradbury, Mental World. I tried to interview him once, so I came in, get him to walk around and show me his town, and he grew up in all the scenes. And he declined to give me his writer's blessing. So I, I, uh, if he writes uh, science fiction, I think now we call it speculative fiction, a lot of what he wrote. But that's not something I do. It would have made it easier to market my book um, if, if I had made it. That's what they people are looking for, at least when I would market it. So, what I think, um, my next book, after I finish, she's uh, going to Chasing Sam Bradbury, I will um, write a, um, a book that's an homage to him. I'm not sure what it will be called. Back. That's, that's really wonderful. Still got the I'm still back to the microphone because now you mentioned Ray Bradbury, and how could I not say that I once uh, had the good fortune to have breakfast with the great Argentine fabulous Jorge, who is Borges. <laughs> He was a, uh, uh, when I was an editor at Indiana University Press, Borges, who was already aged and blind, by his uh, partner who led him around. But he came to visit uh, Indiana University for a couple of weeks as a visiting professor. And by virtue of being an editor at the press there, I got to go to breakfast with him, a small intimate breakfast. And I actually made up a little <laughs> poem about him. Uh, one called the Clarity. It's a four-line delivery type poem that always begins with the name of a famous person. So I wrote one in Spanish. It's probably the only Clarity ever written in Spanish by anyone. It was about Borges. I read it to him, and he was so gracious. He actually corrected me. He gave me uh, a word change. It was very funny. Must have been a very surreal experience. <laughs> So I'm dying to say that. Um, okay, uh, so this is when we ask the audience a kind of question. Do you have a question for our readers? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first for Paul, what do you find um, fascinating about Rick Bradbury? Yeah. 
stuck a little need more. His stock was probably declined a little because so many people have imitated him. But he wrote in such a startling, beautiful, spontaneous fashion <laughs> that no one that no science fiction writer had written before. And and it's and he and, the, and he really was spec speculative fiction uh, uh, of something wicked this way comes. It's such a stunning book, it's so stunning. And um, that's that's why your question is why did I find you? Yeah, I, I you, you're yeah. answering me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just he, 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 how he did it, I do not know. I'll never forget his comment about the library. He said, anybody in America can get a good education, just have lunch in the library. Yes. Yay. Yeah. That's what he did. There was a question in the comments, okay. uh, and it's for both authors. Does your writing process generally involve a great deal of revision? Uh, well, I actually wrote something about that. Uh, and then the short answer is yes. I'm a, I'm what you call a tinkerer. I'm always going back to, uh, I'll dig out things that I stumble. Sometimes I'll look at my computer archive and I'll find things I've written maybe 10 years ago. I honestly don't remember having written them. But when that happens, I'll pull them up and uh, reread them and start tinkering bringing them up to date. Um, but I'd like to uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg uh, famously did first thought, best thought, and I wrote something about that first thought, best thought. It's not Allen Ginsberg, it's Chopra Ripley, who was Allen Ginsberg. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, first thought, best thought. Okay, well, what I wrote was. Uh, Yes, I knew that. Yeah. And uh, well, thank you for that. Thank you. That was great to know. But what I wrote was simply um, uh, first thought, best thought, I agree with that 100%. But on second thought, I think it's totally wrong. Uh, my first book took a fallacious amount of rewriting. Writing group has really helped in that. If you go back to the and spend a day installing the fixes that you, to which you get credence, you have to agree with everything. But that gives you a lot easier job in coming back to rewriting. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't understand, but I wanted to know how did the Canterbury Tales help him with his writing? Okay. Yeah. What was the first thing? Oh, uh, just because uh, you may have noticed, I tend to take a fairly canonical. Uh, Chaucer was a great ironist, and uh, I tend to take a fairly ironical view of pretty much everything, including myself. <laughs> Here's one thing I meant to say. I became friends with a pretty well known folk singer. So I've seen her somewhere in very good shape. She gave me some advice. My wife gave uh, bought me two uh, Zoom sessions with her. Where she, we uh, I worked over my songs with her. She told me about a farmer who, when she was just starting off writing, had given her advice. He just come in. He came into this room. York Statistic is wearing overalls and a dirty shirt and blew everyone away. The song. And he he said, she said, I asked him, I asked him, how do you do it? And he said, he said this to me. He said, Mean every word you write. Yeah. Keep singing it simple, sing it plain, sing it clear, sing it true. I can substitute right. But it's true for writing songs, it's true for writing. But that's that's not trying to embed that whatever I write, that will start not. Well, actually I don't think 
may be a nerd, but he's also obviously a Thai connoisseur. So <laughs> I would, I would uh, like him to say a little bit about his choice of the Thai for this <laughs> evening and whether uh, he's a real fan of, I guess it's Betty Boo. Of course, of course I, I am. And, uh, and my daughter, who's here right now, Europe on uh, Facebook. And, uh, we watched endless, endless, endless hours of Facebook. I think Facebook is a trip, and my nephew is tired. Yeah, I'm happy to be sporting nerds. Around my neck. Any other questions from the audience? Well, the question is all. You said that you wrote the first problem. And then you go to the Do you miss? I, I really miss somewhat the relationship I had writing the pictures that were long ago. Did you, did, you, did you feel any of that? Like, you know, writing in the margins and being all about the journey? I still do on the on grass when I read it. I, I read, I print out everything out, and I write on the margins and rewrite. So I still have some hands. So, I can use my G2. Oh, sorry. So, sorry, no more questions. Unless you want to come and talk to our lovely authors who are going to be selling their books right here, I just want to point out, like I always do, a book is the best gift. So, if you know somebody who is having a birthday, or maybe, I don't know, any occasion, you just like them a lot, you want to give them something wonderful. Come up here and get a book and talk to our authors. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming.